Well, 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 well. It turns out in the last 10 minutes, we've had a little excitement leading up to this epic spy stream. Because they tried to catch us. They tried to keep us out. They made me. Because I announced it all over the internet that I was streaming this webinar about autistic sex education. They made me. But you see, I've learned a thing or two doing spy stream in my day. Because we've been caught before. We've been caught twice before. And because we've been caught before, I knew to have backups. And so, we will be streaming autistic sex education tonight for spy stream i just had to get some things in place in order to do it and i'm going to tell you about what this webinar is and 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 how and what has happened in the last 10 minutes or so and we're still going live with your webinar at seven o'clock dylan and there's nothing you can do to stop it except for cancel your webinar the only way dylan that you are going to not be streamed live on the internet tonight is that you cancel your webinar where you are training people to indoctrinate autistic children into your gender cult. Because we know he's watching right now. Hi. Hi, Dylan. Bree, I cannot do this right now, Bree. I cannot. I gave you the answer yesterday. I am sorry. But, like, this is going to have to wait, girl. I appreciate it. I promise. It is on the list. I promise you. But no, 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 no. The stream is going off as planned. Now, let me show you what we are streaming tonight. And by the way, Dylan, I paid $25 to get in your webinar, so I will be requesting my refund or disputing that charge. Tonight, we are streaming Autistic Sex Education Webinar. This is a real thing. This is real. This is why Dylan, they, them, we respect pronouns on my channel. Dylan, they, them, is a queer, trans, non-binary, autistic Jewish human whose life mission is to make the world a better, safer, and more inclusive place for LGBTQ plus folks and autistic individuals through their work as a LGBTQ plus and autism focused special educator and sex educator, consultant, speaker, and advocate. Dylan doesn't like people who doesn't th who don't think like him. And I know that because he sent out a very insulting email about me. I'm going to read you that email. Whether they know it or not, all educators are in some way or another working with neurodivergent youth. Autistic young people deserve access to inclusive and comprehensive sex education. They need it to be accessible to them, both in that the information needs to be relevant and also that it needs to be taught in a way that meets their educational needs and accommodates their learning styles during the webinar. Dur excuse me, their learning styles during the webinar. Dylan will give everyone the language necessary to talk about autism discuss why autistic sex ed is so necessary, go through content that should be included in an autistic-focused sex education curriculum, and give information on the pedagogical strategies that are most effective for this population. Brian says, being non-binary is a binary. I don't know about that, Brian, but, but you know. So here, here's the point I want to make first. Listen, if all Dylan is doing in this webinar is giving everyone the language necessary to talk about autism. I actually think that that sounds like a good thing. It's good that we learn that. Discuss why autistic sex education is so necessary. Okay, well, I'm not quite on board with that, but maybe he's got some good ideas. We can, we can at least listen along. Go through content that should be included in an autistic-focused sex education curriculum. If there's nothing wrong in that curriculum, then why are you afraid of us seeing it, Dylan? And give information on the pedagogical strategies that are most effective for this population. Okay, well, if that's all that we're doing in this webinar, then why did Dylan send out this email not that long ago where he said, 
Hi, all. So, unfortunately, a right wing nut job. I'm a libertarian. I hate the political right. I don't know why everyone thinks I'm a right wing nut job when I literally, Dylan, I literally have libertarian in my Twitter bio. Unfortunately, a right wing nut job has gotten wind of tonight's event and is planning to infiltrate the webinar and live stream the presentation to a very different audience. But Dylan, if all you're doing is teaching things that we need to use to help autistic people to live happy and fulfilling lives, I just don't know what you're trying to hide. Why why don't you want everyone to learn how autistic people can live happy and fulfilling lives? I don't understand, Dylan. If this is, I mean, I I feel like I feel like everyone of all political persuasions, whether you're a left wing nut job or a right wing nut job or the only sane political party, which is of course libertarian, I feel like all political persuasions could benefit from learning how to help autistic people. I mean, that just makes sense. I have a lot. I D- Dylan, there is no political party that has more autism in it than the Libertarian Party. I promise you, we are the experts in autism. Like at least 50%, if not more, of the people in the Libertarian Party are autistic. If anyone needs help speaking to autistic people, it's me. It's libertarians. Honestly, and even the autistic libertarians need help speaking to the other autistic libertarians. It's just the way it goes. I I was really hoping to get some fun facts tonight about how I could help my my brother in. In order to keep all of you safe, because attending a webinar is a deeply unsafe event, I am sharing a new link and putting the following security measures in place. This will be set up as a Zoom meeting with a waiting room and password, password, autistic. Instead of a webinar, all Zoom names trying to enter the meeting will be cross-checked with the name I have on your registration, so please use the same Zoom name that you use to register. Your audio must stay off, but I have now asked that your camera stay on during the presentation. And how lucky for me that I have spies in your webinar that can turn their cameras on and you won't recognize them. So you will never be the wiser. You see, Dylan, you know what I spent half of my day doing today is setting up a live stream on my second YouTube channel that my spies could live stream your webinar to that live stream just in case you were paying attention to the right wing nut job media today because I announced it for a reason. I wanted to see if we would get caught. It's like I think these things through before I do them. But I have a whole other live stream set up that is unlisted on my second channel. So you aren't going to be able to access it. And I have spies in the webinar that are going to be able to have their cameras on and they ain't going to look like me, honey. They ain't going to be able to look by, like me. We're, we're experienced at Spy Stream, Dylan. This is Spy Stream Season 2. We learned a lot from Spy Stream Season 1. We got our shit together. You ain't going to keep us out. You're still welcome to cancel your webinar, though. Wouldn't that be amazing if we got him to cancel his webinar? <laughs> Cameras stay on throughout the uh, duration of the webinar. Well, I cannot guarantee that having everyone's camera on will 100% protect the meeting. It will not. This does help significantly reduce the risk of this meeting being recorded or live streamed without my knowledge. We're still live streaming it, Dylan. You've been informed. If you cannot have your camera on during the presentation for this evening for any reason, I ask you please come another day or time that I'm offering this training at a time where you are able to be on video. Well, Dylan, that just seems a little bit ableist to me, to be honest. Not everyone has a working webcam, Dylan. Why are you kicking people out of a meeting that they paid to attend? I feel like this is technology ableist at its finest. Someone will be monitoring the chat and everyone's videos the whole time and will immediately remove anyone whose cameras are off or who is being problematic in the chat. Now, Dylan, see, the thing is, we were never going to disrupt your webinar. We were never going to cause problems. We were just going to listen to your presentation. And we're still going to listen to your presentation. And we are going to talk about it amongst ourselves on my chat and let you do your thing. Because here's the thing, Dylan. 
I don't need to disrupt your webinar in order to make the point that I am trying to make, which is that you are indoctrinating autistic children into a gender cult, the most vulnerable of vulnerable populations. If you want to cancel your webinar tonight, if you want to cancel your little training session where you're teaching people how to indoctrinate autistic children, then you are more than welcome to cancel it because that is the only way it is not going to be streamed live on the internet. That is it. Please know that sending this email doesn't thrill me. But if I do not put these security measures in place, then I will have to cancel. And I'm excited to get this information to all of you so I don't have to do that. My safety and the safety of all of you comes first, always. If there are questions, just ask. Well, Dylan, and here's the thing, too. If you cancel this webinar and you run it again another time, we're still going to be there, Dylan. We're still going to be there. And I really don't know what you're hiding. Why why don't you want the general public to hear what you have to say? Why don't you want that to happen? What are you covering up? Don't we all need to guys guys in the chat, don't we all need to just learn how to how to talk to autistic people? Don't we all need I again like listen, I'm I'm surrounded by like the libertarian party is full of autists. And I have a great affection for autistic people. I really do. I love autistic people. They look at the world so creatively. They play these great language games. Like they know autistic people love me because I'm brutally honest and I don't lie to them and I don't I don't try to manipulate them. Autistic people. Dylan, in another universe, we should really be friends because autistic people gravitate to me like moss to a flame. If only you hadn't assumed I was a right wing nut job, which you were wrong about. We could have been friends, Dylan. I and I, I love I love gay people too, gay gay men especially. I mean, I know you're non-binary. I don't want to I don't want to say your gender. I don't want to say because you're non-binary. I'm not, and we respect pronouns on my channel. We do. I'm just saying that gay men fucking love me. Gay men, autistic people. I got I got troves of those. So we actually could have been friends, Dylan. Except that you're trying to covertly teach people how to indoctrinate autistic children into a gender cult. It just doesn't sit well with me. Doesn't sit well. So guys, Spy Stream is on. We're doing it. We're doing it live. Welcome. We have about 14 minutes left to go. Yeah, you can see why I kept this one. Well, I wanted to wait too until I had my other my other spies in place. And and once I was absolutely sure that there was no way that they were going to get around us spy streaming this webinar, that's when I announced it. And I and you know what, to be honest, I wanted to get caught. Maybe just a little bit because it adds to the drama, doesn't it? Doesn't it add to the drama of the entire situation? So let me see. I need to I need to get my other uh like I need to get my other thing up and running. And let me just see. And my super spy can let me know when he's ready to go. We still got 14 minutes, so he doesn't need need to go into the uh webinar yet. He, they, she. <laughs> Oh, man, you guys picked a good one to attend tonight, didn't you? You guys picked a good one. I mean, it is fun. It is fun taking a little bit of a risk, being a little subversive. And they always assume I'm the right wing. They always, always, always do, don't they? (laughs) Oh, my God. This. (laughs) Sorry, I'm just looking at my Twitter because people are retweeting my tweet. I tweeted out that... uh, that email that went out. Guys, welcome to Spy Stream. Now, let me go over the rules of Spy Stream really, really quickly. Uh, hang on. Okay. Let me go over the rules of Spy Stream. Guys, we tonight are watching 
a live presentation. I'm the new Andre Leon Talley. No, I'm not. Don't don't hold me to that standard. <laughs> don't hold me to that standard. Come on. We are watching a live training. We do not know what they're going to do. And given the events of the last, um, well, half hour, it would not be out of this an out of this world possibility that they cancel the entire webinar, which again, man, I don't really care if they cancel it. Like one less webinar teaching people how to indoctrinate autistic children, the better so far as I'm concerned. Um, and so and so if that ends up being the eventuality, then that's all fine, well and good. Um, but, uh, but, but I don't know what they're going to do guys. I don't know what they're going to do. I don't know if they're going to make my spies in their webinar. I don't know if they're just going to start kicking. So when we infiltrated the Vermont human rights commission webinar, they just started kicking people out randomly. And not all those people were me or even people that I knew they were just kicking people out willy nilly to try to find out which ones we were. <laughs> so they, they could conceivably do that again. That could be an eventuality. Um, but we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what they're going to say. I, When we are actually watching the webinar, and we will now be streaming from another live stream that I have set up on my second YouTube channel, um, I am not going to do commentary on the training itself. We are going to let it play out. Now, what I will do is I will type comments in the chat. Just like, just like that. Just like that. There we go. And then I will display the comments on the screen. Hang on. I will display the comments on the screen. And that's how I'm going to make my commentary. Now, if you put in um, like really, really smart or insightful comments in the chat, I'll display those on the screen too. And of course, all super chats will be displayed on the screen unless they're really out of left field and crazy. No, I mean, like all super chats will, you guys never do that. All super chats will get displayed on the screen, but I won't read them out loud again because I actually do want to hear the training. The goal with Spy Stream is never to disrupt their training. I want them doing exactly what they're going to do because I want to show you what really happens when they then when they think no one's watching. And maybe maybe Dylan is like furiously editing his presentation right now to make it less crazy. But again, they don't like. Like, I don't know why that would be necessary. Ooh. Hang on. I just got another email. Hang on. Huh. That's interesting. Hang on. Okay, never mind. That's not for you. Anyway, I don't know. Again, like my biggest question on all of this and why Dylan is so freaked out about the fact that we are streaming his training tonight is what is he really afraid of? Why, like, why would he be afraid of us, of us, uh, of us streaming this training? What is he actually afraid of? Because again, according to Dylan tonight, what we're going to talk about is giving everyone the language to talk about autism. Cool. Discussing why autistic sex education is so necessary. Okay, well, if he's going to make really good points about why it's necessary. I feel like I'm a pretty open-minded girl, man. I was a Democrat for 20 years. I floated around. I, 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 I actually, Dylan, whether you know this or not, I'm actually really, really, really socially liberal. I don't care what you do or how you do it. I don't care that you're trans. I don't care that you're non-binary. I don't care about any of that stuff. It makes no difference to me at all. So maybe there's a universe in which Dylan could actually convince us that autistic sex education is necessary. That could happen. Uh, he's going to go through content that should be included in an autistic focused sex education curriculum. Okay. Well, again, if Dylan is able through his powers of persuasion to convince us that autistic sex education is necessary, then, then like, what is the problem? What is the problem? and give information on the pedagogical strategies that are most effective for this population well that seems like something everyone should know so why is he why is he sending out emails calling me a right wing nut job and like putting security measures in place why is he doing that do you think huh i don't know i don't know at all but guys please mount that like button if you would be so kind 
and uh, we do spy stream on a fairly regular basis um, on this channel whenever really I have the opportunity. LK says, this is Carlin at her best. The taunting is just the chef's kiss. I mean, you got to have fun with it. You got you to gotta play with them sometimes. You got to play with them. And you know why you don't feel bad about doing this? Because they would do exactly the same thing to you. They would do exactly the same thing to you. Never, ever, ever feel bad about doing this. Because they would absolutely do it to you. Remember. These people only want power. That's it. They will lie. They will cheat. They will manipulate. Dylan stole my money that I paid to register for this webinar. He stole my money. I haven't gotten no refund. But I wasn't included on this email. They have no gumption about any of this. So we should have no gumption about it either. We're not disrupting anything. We're not spoiling anything. All we're doing is showing people exactly what happens when these trainings occur. That's it. That is it. Velvet Rooster says, I'm autistic and I don't think this is necessary. I want that old school sex education class to come back. You know, the one where they said there are diseases you can get um, unless you have unless you don't have sex. Man. And then we have, see, see, Dylan, not everyone's on the same page. Stephanie here says, having known some autistic girls who engage in some very risky behavior, I think some sort of sex is, is required. I absolutely could be convinced of that, Stephanie. I could. Now, I strongly suspect that's not the type of thing Dylan's going to be teaching tonight. But if he was to, excuse me, they, I'm sorry. I really do try to respect people's pronouns. I really, really do. So Dylan, they, I apologize. Um, if this is what Dylan is teaching tonight, then I would actually have no problem with it. And I think that that would be really good information to know. I just doubt that's what he's teaching. All right. We're working on getting the stream up and running, guys. And there... God damn it, did I do it again? I I really didn't mean to. Okay. Hang on, I'm just making sure the stream is actually set up to work. Okay, it is. Our super spy is not yet in the webinar, which is fine. I'm just getting it up on my screen, which you guys can't see yet. <laughs> oh, man. Thank God for backups, man. And I just want to thank the members of my unwoke army that were like, Carlin, do you want us in there too? Because I was originally going to do this by myself and I wasn't going to announce it and all this stuff. And no, no. Well, he, he, no, I announced that I announced that I was doing this all over social media. I made a big effing to do of it because I kind of wanted, again, I kind of wanted to get caught and I, and I wanted to see if they were paying attention. No one guess who the spy is. Hang on. Some of you in my supporter community might know who the spy is if you see the person on camera. If you see her, don't point it out, okay? Don't chat it in. Don't don't say the name of the person. Don't do anything. Because if you say her name in the chat, they could have someone watching the chat to try to get some clue about who our super spy is. And they might use that to try to kick people out. So if you see the person in the webinar that is the super spy, because some of you might know who it is based on private conversations yeah loose lips sink ships no one give anyone else away
you know, maybe it's they, maybe their pronouns are they. I do actually have non-binary people in my community. I've got non-binary people in my community. I got trans people in my community. She, he, they, z, zer, zim. We're still waiting. But don't worry, guys. I do have it all, all ready to go. Ah. <sighs> Kurt's pronouns are Lord and Master today. If you want to type your pronouns in the chat, go ahead. So what they're doing is um, this might take a little bit longer for them to get started because they're actually what they said in this email that they sent out like half an hour ago. Is that they're cross checking the names of the registered against the, the names on Zoom as extra security. Oh no, they this is a this is a public chat. Okay, guys, YouTube is public. <laughs> they can see everything happening in the chat. They they're probably watching us right now. Everyone wave hi. Dylan, did you really think I would be so dumb as to announce I was streaming your webinar all over social media if I didn't have a backup plan to stream your webinar if you caught me? God, these people always underestimate. They always underestimate people who don't agree with them politically. I've been doing this stuff for a full year now, man. We got nothing but love for you guys. Just don't indoctrinate kids. It's really all that's required. It's like not that hard. <laughs> Spy stream is fun. We're still in just a holding pattern, waiting to get into that Zoom, guys. I kind of feel bad for Dylan. It, you know what? It would have been actually much nicer for Dylan had no one told him about this and he would have just gone on with his plan. Dylan is probably feeling a lot of stress right now. You know, the neurodivergent do not adapt to change easily is one of the things that I've uh, I've learned from being around the Audis. And, um, and you know, non-autistic people have that too. But, like, that's definitely something is, like, you have to, like, if there's, like, a last-minute freakout, there might be a freakout. And so, you know, D like, whoever told Dylan about this has probably caused Dylan a lot of unnecessary stress when we were going to do it anyway. We're still waiting. I love it when we, when we get caught for spy stream. Oh, 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 something's happening. The zoom screen just changed. But I'm not going to I'm not going to like to protect to protect the identity of these super secret spies. I'm not going to show you guys the stream until everything is kosher and everyone is in and they're getting started. But the screen has just changed. Yeah, what's up, fellow right wing nut jobs? Mount that like button if you're a fellow right wing nut job tonight. <laughs> oh, man, doesn't it feel good? Doesn't it feel good to, like, get one over on these people? Exactly. If Dylan wasn't trying to aud aud indoctrinate autistic kids, then they could proceed with their webinar worry-free. Oh, yeah. Kurt. Kurt. He's out of Colombia. Kurt, Kurt and I were just talking about Colombia the other day on Twitter. Apparently, I didn't know this. Columbia and Teachers College at Columbia University was like home base for the Frankfurt School, which is why every every single like super woke Marxist teacher that we see is like out of Columbia and Teachers College at Columbia. Yeah, Dylan's from Col Dylan, Columbia, fucking Colum Teachers Teachers College, Columbia University. 
Columbia University graduates the most woke teachers in all of higher education, like not by a little bit, like by a lot, a lot. We're still waiting, guys. Almost there. I'm just basically what I'm doing is I'm basically waiting for everything to get settled with this webinar. And I'm not going to show you the screen until everything's settled. So thank you for your patience, guys. They're taking their sweet time because they're cross-checking names. Oh, go taunt away on Twitter, bot. I think that'd be fun. Dylan has like 75 followers on Twitter, so I'm sure today was fun for him. Oh, they already know about it. They already know that's what this email that we're looking at is about. So basically, when I blasted for for people who just joined, when I blasted that I was uh, streaming this particular webinar all over the internet, they found out. I mean, I I sometimes am impressed with my own reach on the internet. I'm kind of like, did progressives even look at what I'm doing? Oh yes, they do. So they found out and they sent out the this email saying a right wing lunatic is streaming our webinar. And so we are putting extra security measures in place. So this evil right wing lunatic does not stream what we are doing on the Internet. But luckily, I had backup because I have multiple spies in this webinar. And uh, I have a backup way to stream it just in case they caught me. But they don't know, but they don't know who's streaming it. I'm not the one in the Zoom. I have spies in the Zoom that are streaming it to a live stream on my second YouTube channel that's unlisted. So they can't find the live stream on my second YouTube channel either because it's unlisted. And then what we're going to be doing is watching the live stream that is coming from my super secret spies that's going over to my second YouTube channel. Yes, I am brilliant in how I'm doing this. We like I said, man, we we like we've done a full this is season two of Spy Stream. We did a whole bunch of spy streams last year. <laughs> we I got caught twice last year on spy stream, so I don't we don't we don't mess around anymore with spy stream. They're they're working on cross referencing the names is what's happening, guys. So it's gonna take a little bit. It's gonna take a little bit longer. But guys, while we're waiting, here's what you guys can do to help me out. Number one, subscribe to the channel if you have not already. Number two, mount that like button for me. Number three, share this stream out with your audiences on Facebook, on Twitter, on whatever platforms you're on that are your favorite platforms. Share the stream out with your audiences to get more people in here. And if you feel so inclined, you can also head over to my Substack, carlin.substack.com, and make sure you're subscribed on there. Now, I do have, I do, well, you know, let me, let me show you my Substack because, you know, this might be as we're, as we're just waiting around for them to get their shit together. This could be how they found out that I was streaming it. <laughs> It's only the number one story on my Substack right now. <laughs> but guys, I am doing a big push on my Substack this month um, to get, I would like to get a hundred new paying monthly supporters on my Substack for five bucks a month for 50 bucks a year. Um, this supports the work I'm doing. This supports me spending all day trying to figure out how to set up spies in this webinar so that we can see this because guys, all this stuff takes time. Listen, none of the stuff that I do is expensive. It's not expensive. It takes time though. And time is money. And if I'm going to be spending time doing this and setting up these spy streams and training spies and getting people set up and getting other live streams set up and getting multiple protections that allow us to stream spy stream for you, you guys. Oh, wait, it's in. It's in. Hang on.
Hang on. Can't stream yet. Anyway, guys, please support the Substack. Please sign up as a paying supporter if you are able to. And we're going to be... Hang on. Let me... I'm just making sure that my spies are ready for me to actually stream. It looks like they are. Oh. Remain on camera and on your We're best in? behavior. And again, I'm sorry that we like had to change formats last minute. I will spare all of you the really um insane website that was sent to me by several people today sharing all the horrible several things people. that the right is going to do with this information several so people all of us um adapting so that <gasps> i don't have to end up attacked but also again this is how that i know that i've made it um all right so i will share my screen did i hook you guys up or what <laughs> i'm so proud of myself I really would love it if, like, at this point on Zoom, we, like, I could still see everyone's faces, but I'm not a technology person. Thank you, Anik. I appreciate it. All right, cool. All right, I'm going to um, keep quiet. So, again, thank you all so much for being here. I um, saw that, Sarah. Um, <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here. I, uh, I just gave this, this presentation at the National Sex Ed Conference in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Um, and it went, went really well and I got a lot of positive feedback, but, um, as someone who like exists at, uh, like that are really financially inaccessible and I want this information to be accessible to people who need it, um, because it's important. So I'm glad that you all are here. Recording yeah. in progress. Thank you. Um, and I will just share that because all of you are here, we are going to be able to donate almost $1,000 to the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network, which is incredible um, because they uh, do, I'll talk a little bit more about diagnostic bias, but uh, autistic folks and non-binary and trans folks who are women. Wait, no, that's my fault. That's my fault. A white male passing person outside, but I come to this work because of some of my invisible identities. So I'm an autistic person. Um, I'm, I also hold several LGBTQ identities. The sound going out there was my Bethesda, fault, Maryland. sorry. I grew up right outside of DC, but I have been on Lenape land in New York City for the past 10 years and can't imagine being elsewhere. Um, my uh, academic educational background is that I graduated from Barnard with a bachelor's in psych and education in 2016. Um, and my ma have a master's in special ed from Teachers College of Columbia, which I finished in 2020. Um, I have, uh, I was a teenager. Um, I started, got my special ed start at an inclusive summer camp in Bethesda, Maryland, and fell in love with the field and have stuck around. Um, so between all my academic pursuits, have uh, spent some really amazing time in the special ed self-contained private school world in New York City. Um, now I live two lives. One is I'm a doctoral student at the School of Education. At Research focus is queer and trans inclusive autistic focused sex ed. Um, so this, um, and then my non-academic life is that I am back at my alma mater doing really awesome queer and trans work. Um, so I get to work with queer and trans students at Barnard and provide competency trainings for faculty and staff, which just makes me happy. So I don't know, I'm an educator. I'll just give you like a little bit of a, this is where we're going today. Um, so I have found that um, it is very helpful to get everyone on the same page with vocab. I start all my trainings, autistic or queer trans issues around um, yeah, I start all trainings with, with like, let's just get on the same page about vocab so that we all know what we're talking about. Um, then I will give us the why, um, the how and the what, except I think that I did switch the order. So it, forgive me. Um, but we, yeah, we're going to talk about autistic sex ed. But first, let's talk about autism. 
which is my favorite subject to talk about. So um, I am coming at autism from the neurodiversity paradigm, the neurodiversity framework. Um, neurodiversity is a term that's been around since the late 90s. Um, it, I, it just means variation in the human brain. Um, neurodiversity is part of the human condition. It has been around since the beginning of time. It will be around forever. Um, I personally have only heard neurodiversity start to like be a buzzword in the past few years, even though it has been around since, since 98. Um, when we are talking about neurodiversity, it is not one person is not neurodiverse. We are a neurodiverse society. One person is neurotypical or neurodivergent. Um, neurotypical, which is frequently abbreviated, um, which is frequently abbreviated and T is just like, what is expected in the brain neurologically typical? Is anyone really neurotypical? I don't know. Who's to say? Um, but um, it, it is basically, I don't like the word normal, but that is like when people are talking about neurotypical brains, they, they are talking about normal brains. Um, and then neurodivergent, which is frequently abbreviated ND in um, neurodivergent spaces, just means divergent from the norm. Um, there are so many graphics that I will not share here because there are too many of them on all the different types of neurodivergence, but I feel like um, mental illness, ADD, ADHD, autism are just a few types. Um, I When I talk about neurodivergence, I'm usually talking about autism or ADHD, but there are people with a wide variety of diagnoses who, who self-identify as neurodivergent. All right, so we'll see if this video plays. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but there are really two types of autism definitions or disability definitions in general. Um, we, so, um, the medical model, which is based on a DSM-5 or all other versions of the DSM, um, is the medical model of autism. So it talks about autism as a diagnosis. I will talk a little bit about what those criteria are. Um, oh, okay. Um, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what those criteria are, um, but it does, it is a, it is a, um, it is a deficit based framework. So it talks about um, social and behavioral deficits. Unfortunately, it is framed completely as like things that autistic people, I like to say suck at, but can't do, um, um, which obviously is not like the most affirming framework. Um, and then there are many other definitions, but I will pull from the Autistic Self Advocacy Network. Um, which frames it as more of a difference. They use the social model. They talk about the fact that like everyone has different brains. That's how people work. Um, and society has to accommodate, um, to, to meet those needs. I, this is just the Blair Monty Sparter in Seconds video. They're very quick. There are a couple of them in here. She is a great friend and collaborator. Let's see if this plays. Can someone, Angela, give me a hot thumbs up if you can hear it. Sparter in Seconds, autism. Autism is a type of neurodiversity. It can be understood as different ways of Thinking, processing, understanding, being, socializing, and communicating. Autism does not need to be cured or fixed. Ableism does. Neurodiversity is a good thing. Support actually autistic people and listen to us. Learn more from these organizations and creators on screen. Start of a Um. So I will just, I will just tell, like, people are always like, I want to learn more about autism. What can I read? And I'm like, okay, my, you know, my professors hate this, but I actually refuse to read anything academic on autism. It's all written by non-autistic people and it's all like pretty horrific. Um, so when people ask me how to learn about autism, I say, go search the actually autistic hashtag on Instagram and Twitter um, and learn about autism from autistic folks, um, which again, people in my academic life don't like, um, but that's okay. It's the truth. In oh, no, don't play again. Okay, so this is really text heavy. Both of these slides are, these are literally like I copy and pasted from the DSM's website. So you do not have to like sit here and read them. You can look them up yourself. Um, but in order to be formally diagnosed with autism, which we will talk a little bit more about why that's a problem later, um, you need to have three um, deficits in this area um, of social things. So I'll just talk a little bit about like deficits in social emotional reciprocity can look like, okay, having a hard time having back and forth conversations, um, a lot of, um, a lot of trouble. Like I, you know, I've worked with a lot of kids who like, I'll be like, how are you? And they'll say good. And like, don't know that 
typically in a conversation, the next step of that, the next piece there is to be like, and how are you? Um, so things like that, not that they have to care how I'm doing. Um, deficits in nonverbal communication. So I personally have a really hard time reading body language and facial expressions. Um, so things like that. And then just like trouble with relationships in general, I will talk in depth about why that's relevant to autistic sex ed, um, because it is. Um, but these are, these are people, kids, myself who like struggle with like friendships and other types of relationships. Um, so I think there's, you need three of those and then two behavioral delays. Um, I will not go through these because they are very specific, but, um, any sort of, um, be behavioral delay, uh, in, in, in autism world, we call them RRB is restricted repetitive behavior patterns. Um, but just like, special interests, fixated interests, um, lots of patterns. Um, you know, when we talk about like autism in young kids, it's a lot of like, oh, my kid is lining things up and like making patterns and things and and that fits here. Um, this also speaks to um, being uh, easily over under stimulated. Um, I will say again, those are very text heavy and I do not need to read them to you because you all can read them yourself. Um, but I will just say that these three things are important. I think that um, uh, one of the big things that is happening right now is that people are like seeing autistic representation um, and being like, I have one or two autistic traits, like maybe I'm autistic. So I would just name that um, you, autism does not like develop, it just does not develop later in life. It is something that exists in childhood too. Um, and it symptoms must be present in, in childhood. Um, and they must cause like a, and I think it's like significant impact on your activities of daily living, um, and cannot be better explained by other diagnoses. But again, these are all like straight from the DSM. So, um, you're welcome to read them yourself. Okay. Um, this is the autistic self advocacy networks definition. Um, this is like, I, I think very helpful. I have no issue with the medical model. I, I personally feel very validated reading the DSM and being like, oh, these are things other people really struggle with. But I know a lot of people who don't like that model. Um, so this is just a different framework. Um, excuse me, this speaks a little bit about um, autistic bias, which I'll talk more about, but how autistic adults, autistic girls and autistic people of color have a much harder time getting a formal diagnosis. Um, I will name right now and forever that self-diagnosis is a super valid uh, autism experience. Um, I personally am self-diagnosed and I've been very open and honest about that everywhere. Um, there is no one way to be autistic. There are autistic people of every other marginalized identity as well. Um, here are six things that, you know, might be different for autistic folks. Um, take the, I I like the Autistic Self Advocacy Network. There's been some criticism of like their approach to certain racial issues. So take that with a grain of salt. Um, but I think this is still a helpful framework. Okay, this is my like big, we are not using functioning labels during this presentation. Why? Because we don't use them. Why? Because they're bad. Um, I like grew up in a in a like low functioning, high functioning language type of world. Um, I do not like those phrases. People tell me all the time. They're like, Dylan, you're so high functioning. I'm like, what does that mean? Um, like, what what does it mean to you? I think that um, they. I can tell you, it means that like I am successful. I have a job. I live alone. I am in a PhD program. But like, I you know, there are a lot of other things I can't do or struggle with. I don't cook. I can't cook. I don't. Um, so it's just like it. It doesn't really mean anything to me. Um, I I tell people in my program all the time that I can link anything about disability. To Move. So I will tell you that also the functioning labels come from um, harmful beliefs about capitalism based on what people can produce and contribute to society. And people are people, even if they don't produce things or contribute to society in your expe expected way. Um, and it's irrelevant. I also think that like, I tell people this all the time, but like no one functions the same way everywhere. If you can find me one person who is the same around their parents, their friends and in the bar, like, please send them to me. I want to talk to them. People are different around different people. People are different in different situations. That's very normal. Um, no one is high or low functioning all the time. I talk very specifically around like what people need in different places. Um, that someone might have higher support needs somewhere, lower support needs somewhere else. Um, yeah, here's another easy Blair video because she's very concise and I am not. 
you have ADHD? I couldn't tell. You must be very high functioning. Bravo. Actually, functioning labels are ableist and classist. Functionality is a great way to describe your Wi-Fi router, but not people. We aren't machines. People who are deemed low functioning are stigmatized, infantilized, and dismissed. High functioning people are weaponized against folks with the same diagnosis. This fallacy of high and low functioning is widespread in discussions of autism, but has since been used more broadly. Ableism forces people to hide or mask their neurodivergent traits. Our productivity does not define our work, but functioning labels reinforce this classist myth. So how should we refer to autistic people? By their names and pronouns. Anyway, if you don't follow Blair on Instagram, she is very informative and educational and wonderful. I share her content all the time. But truly, functioning labels are very annoying and frustrating for all autistic people. Stop using them. Um, if you're like, how do I not use them in this setting? People are always like, my school makes me use them. I'm like, well, tell your school to stop. Um, there are so many other um, phrases and frameworks and things to use. And literally all autistic people everywhere um are always talking about um no longer using them so really this is a like please listen to the autistic people in the world plug you have no, stop okay so we've all heard of like i i maybe it's a euphemism but everyone's like ooh, they're on the spectrum i don't really know what that means at this point in my life um i frequently say it for myself but i don't say it for other people it feels very abstract but also this spectrum um we also say the gender spectrum. I think that's very confusing too, because I'm, as a non-binary person, I'm like, you mean male, female, non-binary is in the middle, but that's not how I conceptualize my gender. It's also not how I can conceptualize my autism. So instead of any sort of like linear spectrum, first of all, it's always from low functioning and high functioning. I love pulling graphics from like autistic creators who are like making cool color wheel drawings. I'm not an artistic person um, at all, but I think that like people have different skill sets and strengths and deficits and they lie at the intersection of this pretty color wheel and no person, I don't know, I'm a three dimensional person. I don't want to think about someone putting me on a line. That's not really like, that's a very two dimensional measurement of my three dimension, three dimensional personhood. Um, I, I don't love the like on the spectrum phrase, but, um, I know that a lot of places, a lot of places use it. Um, okay, so this is my like, I know, I know that people are still being taught person first language. I know that because I've been in schools where people are still being taught person first language, but um, the huge majority of the autistic community, um, the huge majority of the autistic community prefers autistic person. Um, person first language is person with autism, person with a disability, um, identity first language. Person first language comes from a really good place of like, we do not want people to be defined by their disability like they are a person first. Um, and the disability community was kind of like, well, I can't be separated from my disability. So I don't know why you're trying to do that. Um, also, I like, we are not talking about this with other identities. Like if someone told me I was a person with gay, I would be like, that's not even grammatically correct. So I don't know why we're trying to do it with diagnoses. Um, writ large the huge majority of the disability community prefers identity first language i will show you this video and you will see that that is disability dependent um the identity first language actually comes majority out of the autistic community um the autistic community was like i would like to be referred to as autistic um so yeah and now and now we use disabled person and disability i i talk all the time about how like Dis disability and autism are neutral terms. They do not put moral or value judgment on a person. They just are who you, they are just a fact of life. And if we agree that they are neutral terms, then we don't have to worry about saying them. Um, but obviously ableism exists as well. I'm autistic. I heard that has autism or person with autism is more appropriate. That gets us into identity first language versus person first language. Oh, mm -hmm. identity first language places that person's diagnosis as part of their identity. I am an autistic person. Person first language literally centers the person before their diagnosis. I'm a person with spina bifida. You know, so which one's correct? Technically, both. No, like, hate you are. The way a person self describes is more important than what you may have heard is more respectful. Identity is personal. Even within one community, there will be people with different perspectives. If you're unable to directly ask someone what's respectful to them, seek out resources. But make sure you're seeking out resources created by and for the community. 
which won't always be the organization with the most funding or visibility. If your anti-ableism begins and ends with your terminology, Level up. My favorite part of that video is like the very subtle dig at Autism Speaks that's like, it's not always the organization with the most funding or visibility. And I'm like, yes, for example, stop going to Autism Speaks. This is not a presentation on why Autism Speaks is a hate group. I will let all of you do that research on your own. Um, but the autistic community has a huge problem with that organization. Um, anyway, this last point just says, if you want to know how to talk about a disabled person, ask them. Um, we ask people for their names, we ask people for their pronouns. If you're talking to someone about their disability, it is okay to ask how like they refer to their disability. That's way better than making assumptions. I love inserting Blair's Smarter in Seconds videos because it gives me a break from talking and this is a lot of me talking. I'm autistic. No, stop. Okay, so we've covered, we're hopefully now all on the same page about language we should and should not be using to talk about autism. So why are we here hopefully we're all here because we agree that um because we we agree that um we agree that autistic sex ed is a human right but um let's let's build a case for it because obviously if we all agreed then we wouldn't be here and we would all be doing it and it would not be an issue but it is an issue so i wish that i could like stop the presentation right here and be like, guess what, everyone? Autistic students get sex education because access to this information is a human right. Autistic people deserve healthy and safe and sexual and romantic relationships. And everyone would be like, that's awesome. Congratulations. Like, let's all go home. Let's be finished. Um, unfortunately, we are not there yet. So uh one of the one of the things that we talk about, and this is just like a general, we are gonna talk about this. Um is that when you don't give autistic students adequate adequate sex education there are some really like grave and dangerous consequences for that population um yeah i i i will talk about it i like we have to talk about it it's hard i know but we have to we have to do it um okay i i did i did stand up on a national stage at the sex ed conference and tell everyone that sex ed sucks um, so I will tell you all the same thing, which is that sex ed writ large is like not great right now. It is not meeting the needs of most of our students. Um, but for the huge majority and like, you know, am I surprised that the right wing came for me today? No, sex ed is like one of the things that's being majorly attacked across the country. Um, there are horrific things being said about sex educators everywhere. Um, people are trying to roll rights back. Um, we are seeing all the conversations around anti-trans bills and groomers, all of it is connected. But for most people in K-12 schools who are not in any sort of self-contained classroom, they are getting some sort of sex education. Um, I will say that people are always like, well, I don't teach special education. And I'm like, maybe you don't. Um, and if you are not teaching special education, like maybe there are certain populations that you are not engaging with. However, I will tell you, based on all the research that is out there, there are autistic people in every single gen ed classroom as well. Um, so even if you are like, I don't teach special ed, this is irrelevant to me. I promise there are autistic students in your classroom. Maybe uh, maybe you don't know that they are, but there are autistic students in every gen ed classroom in the country, I promise. So this information needs to be given in a way that is accessible to that population. Um, a lot of neurotypical people, right? Sex ed is not going great across the country. A lot of times neurotypical students um, are getting some of this information from peer groups, right? Like from their friends or at home. Um, and uh, a lot of autistic folks are excluded from peer groups or don't have the same type of friends or are not able to, to navigate that information as well. And um, I know that like we all know Google um, but there's a lot of misinformation on Dr. Google um, and uh, knowing what is accurate information versus what is inaccurate information. So the answer of like, please go Google that is actually not super helpful because this is a population who like still needs a little bit more help understanding what is correct. So even kids who are like not getting explicit sex ed in school are frequently still getting this information in other ways. and for all intents and purposes, autistic folks are not. Okay, so um, CECUS, which definitely stands for something or used to, is a major sex ed organization. And um, 
here is what we know about why this isn't happening already. Um, I will let you read this quote. I think it's very powerful. But when I hear, when I hear from people who are like, why are you, why do you even do this work? I'm like, well, why don't you think I should be doing this work? And there's a lot of belief that autistic people either are uninterested in sex um, or just like won't be able to, you know, don't have the capacity to understand. So that's ableism that they don't have the capacity to understand. And um, research on autistic individuals that paints the population as overwhelmingly asexual is just false. Um, I will say that I am knee deep in academic research at any given time. And this research that said all autistic people were asexual is like up until five to 10 years ago. So it's like, there's a lot of it and it's like many to wade through. Um, but now we know that this is untrue. I will say someone is always like, but they're, my autistic friend is asexual. Of course, there are autistic asexual people, just like there are asexual people of every identity. However, the majority of autistic people are not asexual. So, and, and of course, like autistic folks can understand sex and deserve that information. Okay. Uh, I know we have people on this call who are like, some are educators, some are parents, but I will give you, I'm, I'm an educator. So I'll come, I'll come to you with like, when I'm like, hey, teacher, why are you not teaching your autistic student sex education? Here are the three top reasons I hear. One, I don't talk about sex, it makes me uncomfortable. Two, I don't think my autistic students can handle it. Three, I'm scared of parents. Um, I will tell you, I am also terrified of parents, so that one makes a lot of sense to me. Um, they are my least favorite people to deal with, but I will talk a little bit about the end, at the end about like how I handle parents. Um, I will say, I'm gonna say a lot of words on this call, um, about sex, but I will start right now that um, if talking about sex makes you personally uncomfortable, um, you need to get better friends and your friends need to make you talk about sex because it is a very important thing to be talking about. It will go so far for you. Um, if talking about, if you cannot talk about sex with your friends, you are definitely not talking about it with your students. I promise you will have a healthier, happier, better sex life if you start talking about sex with your friends. So, if you are uncomfortable talking about sex with your students, my first recommendation to you is to go talk about it with your friends. And if you don't have friends who will talk about it, please let me know because it is my favorite to topic to talk about and I will be your friend and we can talk about it because all of my friends will tell you that it is all I talk about. So I'm happy to be that person for you. Two, um, ableism is real. I understand that you might've been told that autistic people cannot understand this or um, are incapable or maybe even uninterested, that's not true. Um, if you are an educator or a parent of an autistic student, I hope you believe in the capacity and potential of the person, the autistic people in your lives, and therefore believe that they can understand this as long as, as, long as this information is presented to them in an accessible way. All right, so this is my like we have to talk about this it sucks i hate it it's hard i wish i didn't this is like my few slides that i'm like every time i'm like they're garbage i wish i could take them out but we have to do it a because this is how people get grant money to do things by playing this card and b because it's true um so well i would like to be doing sex ed for the pure purpose of it's good and people deserve this information unfortunately also we know that sex education is prevention um, so comprehensive sex education works to prevent a whole lot of things, um, but here are some that are specifically relevant for this community. So comprehensive sex ed works to prevent individuals being sexually abused or sexually abusing others, both of which happen, public behaviors that lead to incarceration or presence on sex offender registries, which is very common for autistic folks, um, unwanted pregnancy, which uh, used to be and still sometimes is um, addressed with forced sterilization um, and for uh, sexually transmitted infections. There's a whole paper of mine on the history of forced sterilization. It's very sad and scary, but I'm happy to share with people who are interested. Okay, so this is my like soapbox, which is that giving autistic people in your life this information is your responsibility. You do have to do it. I'm sorry if it scares you. I am happy to help talk you through it, but like you are setting people up to succeed. When you don't do it, you are setting people up to be in dangerous situations that I am going to talk about now. Okay, so these stats suck. They are terrifying. They are also the truth. 
Um, 40 to 70% of disabled girls experience sexual abuse before the age of 18, as well 30% of disabled boys. Those are very high numbers. Um, they're very scary numbers. Um, obviously, sexual abuse is bad. Um, and uh, this is a population of people who are really, really, really at risk. So talking about these things is very important, kind of especially with this population, though I hope we are having this conversation with all young people. Um, disabled girls are also at a higher risk for sex trafficking, also very scary. Um, this is because that we are not teaching young disabled folks that they a have a right to bodily autonomy. Um, and also like, what is abuse and how do you recognize abuse and how do you tell someone about abuse? And, um, if we are not giving people these tools, then we are just continuing to create these really high statistics, which again, are very sad and scary. I, I am not a statistics person, but I tell people all the time, I'm like, numbers like 70% round up to 100. 100 is bad. That is not a good statistic number. Um, so again, we would like to prevent these things. All right, this is my like, I hate, I, I hate the phrase deviant. That's why it's in parentheses, but I will use it because this article uses it and I think it's important. Um, there is a really high number of autistic folks who are incarcerated, get arrested, or on are on sex offender registries. In my like humble opinion, these things are completely preventable. Um, and unfortunately, the things about the thing about stuff like that is is like it's very hard to strike that from your record, so that follows you. Um, so some of the big things that get autistic people in trouble: public masturbation, undressing or exposing genitals in public sexual fixation on people or objects and stalking. I have this like wild belief that really good sex ed can prevent all four of these things from happening. Maybe I'm, you know, off my rocker, but I don't think so. Um, I will say that like a lot of this is just because people don't know that there's like a time and a place for things. Nobody has had this explicit conversation with them. Um, you know, I say this, this is one of my favorite things to say, but like, to say but like yeah guess what getting aroused in public is super normal there are a lot of hot people in the world it is not appropriate to handle that in public you have to do that at home but people don't know that um and so those behaviors are happening in public also like yes getting aroused in public is normal sorry all right so that is my argument for why we need to do this so now let's talk about content um or the what here is my, I'm going to go into each of these, but um, here's just like in, in Dylan's life dream post PhD, they get to write a sex ed curriculum. Um, and here are some of the things that would go in my sex ed curriculum. Um, words for body parts, um, functions, acts and behaviors, including slang terms for these things. I'll tell you a story when I talk about slang of my all time favorite autistic individual. Um, puberty hygiene, taking care of one's body, consent three times in all caps. Um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, consent three times in all caps, bodily autonomy in school situations, masturbation, gender and sexuality, the internet, and then, um, sexual exploitation, which we just talked about a little bit. If you did not come here expecting to hear me say words like dick and cock, I'm sorry, and you don't know me very well. Um, but, um, I think that, uh, you gotta, you gotta, so use anatomically correct language. Yes. Even if it makes you super uncomfortable. Yes. Even if you use different language to talk about your own body, I do not care what you call your vagina or penis. We are doing students a huge disservice when we do not teach them those words. It is so hard to report abuse of someone touching a part of your body. if You don't know what part of your body they've touched. Um, I there are some really great like anatomical pictures on Planned Parenthood's website if you don't have like anatomy books lying around. Um, but like teach students the difference between like a clitoris and a vulva or a penis and a scrotum. Those are different parts. And you need to be able to like make a report if someone is touching you somewhere and that language matters. Um, also, like I don't love privates or down there or like any of that stuff. It is not helpful. Um, it is not helpful to, to use those things with students. Um, I used to do this presentation and I would make everyone come off mute and say their favorite slang term for penis and vagina. I will not make you all do that. It's like past 7 p.m. on a Thursday. Um, but 
it is really helpful. No, I'm not saying teach kindergartners this, but when you're working with autistic folks for like starting to get to an age where they're having conversations around sex, um, it's really important to teach them the slang terms uh, for these body parts too, both so that they can recognize them and also so that they can just like use them in a sexual context. Um, like it's totally legitimate if someone wants to use penis to talk about their body during sex, but a lot of people use words like dick and cock and maybe that's a little bit of a, of a sexier word and uh, to see people like have a have a right to to <laughs> to know that those are words that they use um i my like inspiration for all the work that i do is a young man i've been working with for many years um i feel like his, his mom i think is here um and um my favorite story about this this person from recent years is that we were having a conversation around like what if i want to have sex what do i do um and we were on a walk and he he asked me, he was like, can I say to someone like, will you touch my member? And it took me a second to be like, what are we talking about? Um, and then he was like, can I say to someone like, will you touch my member? And I I was like, okay, that's not an inappropriate word to call your penis. Like that's a very normal, like it is definitely a slang term. But if you are in a situation where like you're about to have sex with someone and you use member, that's probably an unexpected word to be hearing in a sexual context. And, you know, here are, we were taught i like got to talk to him about how dick and cock are like words that a lot of people with penises used to talk about their bodies in a sexual context so slang is important um i am happy to if if these are conversations you would not like to be having with your children um i'm happy to have them for you because they bring me a lot of joy okay consent is like again three times all caps it could be a whole slide um consent is hard because a lot of it is nuanced um and uh in addition to being vulnerable to sexual violence autistic people are um vulnerable uh maybe vulnerable is not the right word capable of committing sexual violence against people because they do not understand the 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 things involved in consent so this is going to involve like really explicit instruction around how to give consent and how to ask for consent I teach exactly what to say. I use scripts. I role play. Um, I'd like to do this to this part of your body. Can I? May I do X, Y, Z thing to you? Um, it is really important to explain that you have a right to say no and what it means. Again, this goes back to reporting what it means if someone doesn't listen to that. Um, also, it's really important to teach students what to do if someone says no to them. Um, I will speak for myself. It is not a word that I like to hear or I'm really good at hearing. Um, but if someone says, no, you may not do this thing to me, you got to respect that. Um, it is very hard for a lot of autistic people to sit with, like, I, someone has told me I can't do something that I want to do. Um, but it's really important to teach them that, like, when someone says, no, you may not do this, like, that is something that needs to be respected. Um, consent is a thing that goes on way beyond just sex, right? Like, we know that, um, People do not always want to be hugged or touched by family members or friends. Um, so I think it's super important to teach consent using the word consent, excuse me, across all settings. Um, yes, consent around sex can be taught uh, with older kids, um, but I think using the word consent needs to start like kindergarten and kids need to be taught that like they need to ask and give consent before touching people. And maybe that's crazy to talk about teaching consent in kindergarten, but I also know that it works. Um, I have worked in schools where consent comes into question sometimes. Um, it is your job as educators to model consent for the students. I know that um, I have worked in schools where we put kids in restraints. Um, and I know that that is like, if it is done well and for the right reasons, I, I really get it. Um, if you are going to do this, I think it is super important to talk them through it, especially because usually putting, not usually, when you are putting a kid in a restraint, it is happening without their consent, but it is happening because they are hurting themselves or someone else. And it is okay to need to put kids in a hold in order to prevent them from hurting themselves or someone else, but it is important to walk them through the fact that you are touching them and why. Um, I also know that uh i there are a lot of people who work in schools who help kids with things like toileting or getting dressed that is very vulnerable um and i think it's really important to walk kids through like 
I'm going to touch you here for this purpose. Um, I'm taking off your shirt because I am going to help you put on your pajamas for pajama day, or I am going to like wipe you because you're on the toilet, things like that. I just model walking them through those things out loud. Um, also it helps you, um, protect yourself. If, uh, that you were like narrating those things out loud, if someone were to try and weaponize, um, something against you, uh, abusing a child it is helpful to be like well that you know you you overheard xyz thing this is what i was doing so sometimes modeling those things and walking them through those things also help you helps you cover your ass all right puberty which um sucks and i have now done twice um is just something that happens to everyone um unless you have some sort of comorbid disability majority of autistic people go through puberty on the exact same developmental timeline as a lot of their neurotypical peers. Sometimes people tell me that like, oh, I don't like do puberty with my autistic students because like they don't go through puberty at the same time. That is wrong. Um, people with various disabilities do have puberty delays. Unless an autistic person has other disabilities, they will go, they have the exact same developmental timeline in terms of puberty. So that means that you are having these conversations with people exactly when you're having them with their neurotypical peers. Um, the fun thing about puberty is that there are social realities involved in not taking care of things during puberty. For example, you don't shower and you smell, people don't want to hang out with you. And that is like really super okay and legitimate because no one wants to be around smelly people. So explaining to people the importance of showering, wearing deodorant, things that a lot of neurotypical kids are like getting because they're like, oh, these people aren't hanging out with me anymore. Maybe I need to shower more than once every three weeks. Um, might need to be explicitly told to autistic students. And I think it's important to share the, the social consequences of, um, to share the social, social consequences of those things so that people know um, that in fact, you do need to be doing those things. Um, okay, puberty is very overwhelming. It was overwhelming to me the first time I did it, and it was even more overwhelming to me the second time I did it. I am not going to do it a third time. Um, but there are a lot of sensations involved in in, in puberty. Honestly, if I, if we're thinking about it, like I will give, I will say it one time, and then I will move on. Um, but like, sex can also be very overstimulating. It, explaining to someone, like <laughs> I don't know, having an orgasm is kind of an overstimulating experience, but like you might have to get someone used to. Um, but okay, that's that's a separate conversation. Um, but there are new feelings during puberty, physical and emotional that they might get not that they might need to get used to, um, such as hair growing, skin getting oily. Um, I, I was not really prepared for what it was going to feel like to have a beard, um, or to have body hair all over the place. Those are things that like, it takes some getting used to. Um, body hair increases on everyone during puberty. Uh, but a lot of people we know, it is not a surprise that people of varying gender identities are told to keep body hair, to not keep body hair. Um, given certain options, I think exploring all those things, explaining that a lot of people with certain gender identities do shave, but they don't have to. Here's why. Um, it's very important. I will also say that, um, <laughs> never have I related more to 14 year old boys than when I was like six months on testosterone. There is a lot of emotional change happening during puberty. Um, and uh, the, it is very hard to like regulate emotions um, during that time. So I think a lot of those conversations are really important to be having. Uh, research that says kids are starting puberty younger is correct. Um, so I think by like third, fourth grade, these conversations are necessary because a lot of kids are starting puberty around that age. Okay, periods, which um, I don't have anymore, but I hear some people do. Um, uh, so getting a period is a, a kind of overstimulating experience in itself, right? Like you've never bled um, before and then suddenly you are doing it once a month. Um, explicit instruction and taking care of oneself during this time is very important. Periods come with shifts in mood, right? I think that is not a surprise to anyone. Um, so be prepared for increased, like maybe an increased need for regulating behaviors and emotions during these times. I'm a huge fan of menstrual cups, but I know that like tampons and, and menstrual cups involve, um, different things. I prefer pads, but I, I think that like pads can be very overstimulating too. I don't know, explore options, have a conversation. Um, 
teach teach people about their options, help them choose, explore together. Um, yeah, I don't know. Periods are periods are a thing that we do. Okay, testosterone is a crazy life experience um, and comes with shifts in mood, increased irritability, and lowered frustration tolerance. So this is a uh, like puberty for folks who have testosterone um, in their bodies, whether they're doing it as adults, like I did, or during puberty, it's just like, be aware of all of the emotional, um, side effects of that. Um, taking care of one's face and beard and body hair is important. Um, also I will say that like testosterone causes people to smell. So, um, reminder to just like stress the importance of taking regular showers, wearing deodorant. I have no problem telling people like people do not want to be around you when you smell. It has nothing to do with you as a person. It just like is very overstimulating for them. Please take care of yourself. Okay, this is one slide when really I could do a whole hour and a half on masturbation is my absolute favorite subject to talk about. Any of my friends can tell you. So um, masturbation is normal and it's healthy. There are some like, if you Google like <laughs> side effects or not side effects, like health effects of masturbation, there are like, Forbes articles and Teen Vogue articles and People articles. There are so many side effects, not side effects. There are so many incredible like health things that masturbation can help with. It is good for you. Um, it is normal to explore. However, it is something that needs to happen in the privacy of one's home, um, which is hard because a lot of students start exploring themselves at school, um, whether they're stimming or not. Um, they find out that it feels good. They want to do it all the time. So explicit conversations around where to, to, to masturbate are important. Um, most people figure out that masturbation feels good before puberty. Um, but then puberty like spikes your sex drive and, um, you might have more explicit conversations around it. Um, I love the word masturbation. It's one of my favorite words in college. I did a sex and sexuality discussion group where we like came up with as many slang terms for masturbation as we could. Somewhere there's a list. I'm happy to share it. Um, but I don't just say like, stop touching yourself. Or um, I think it's an important word to teach. I know a lot of adults who are friends of mine who like can't say the word masturbation out loud. Good practice. Um, I do not, and I will, this is my like big, don't do this. Do not say masturbation is a, inappropriate. Um, I don't use the word master. I don't use the word inappropriate to talk about masturbation in any way ever. I don't even say like it's inappropriate to do it here. It is so hard to unlearn stigma around masturbation later. Um, it is it is so hard. Like the number of my adult friends who like are working to unlearn internalized shame and stigma around masturbation is so many. And it's just because they were not told that like this is a normal and healthy behavior. Here is when and where to do it. Um, so I think that be very careful not to conflate the two. Um, I think that just like redirection um, around like this is a home behavior um, and at home, you know, I just saw a comment in the chat, like you might need to have conversations around when and where at home. And like, this is not something everyone wants to hear. Um, you know, there are definitely boundaries around that um, if you are a parent of an autistic student. And again, like they're probably gonna figure out that it feels good on their own. They just might need redirection or explicit instruction around when and where to do it. Um, again, this is a public masturbation is a big, big, big thing that gets autistic individuals like arrested on sexual offender, sex offender registry. So it is very easy to prevent those things from happening by having conversations about it early. It's important. Um, if you are a parent, again, this is my offer to like, I will happily come talk about masturbation with your autistic child. I've done it with many autistic children it is it brings me a lot of joy. And it's kind of, it's, if it makes you uncomfortable, because you're like, I'm a parent, I am not a, that child parent, and I'm happy to do it. Um, okay, uh, porn and cyber safety. Um, porn literacy. I Porn literacy is important. I am not a porn literacy expert, but I will tell you that in general, it means like teaching students things about ethical porn, where to find porn, ethical porn consumption. It also helps students get literally, literally, if you break it down, it helps them get literate with porn, which like helps them understand that porn is not reality. No, like, <laughs> I don't know, lesbian porn is very different than real life lesbian sex. Um, and I did not know that based on the porn that I was watching until I started doing it. 
and that what you're watching is very different from what actually exists out there. I think a whole everyone, neurotypical or neurodivergent, needs some porn literacy, but that, you know, whatever. Um, I think explaining the legal and safety issues associated with porn websites is very important. Be very clear about the legal consequences associated with porn. Um, very, those um, things vary by state. They are just really good to know. Also, like young folks are sexting and swapping nudes. Uh, you might want to be clear with them about the laws around those things in their states as well, um, because there are risks involved. I am not here to tell you that nobody is doing it. I'm here to tell you that they are all doing it. Um, and you should just have conversations around safety and the law and risk um, when you're having those conversations with them. But again, it is like a normal human behavior. Okay, I, I can like see out the top that there are things in the chat, but because I'm talking, I, it's like, I will, I will come back to them. Please save your questions for the end and I will answer all of them, but I'm just gonna keep going. Okay, uh, sexual safety, um, talk about unwanted pregnancy, talk about abortion, talk about sexual protection. Um, condoms are great, internal condoms are great, dumbbell bands are great, gloves are great, variety of birth control are great. There are a lot of options out there. It's really important to talk to people about them. Um, if you are a person working in a school, I think that like it cannot hurt to like bring condoms and internal condoms and dental dams to the classroom and like allow students to like touch, feel, ask questions about those things. Um, just so that the first time they're experiencing a condom is not when they are trying to put one on. Um, I don't know that if we are still doing like condoms on food, but um, I definitely like someone made me put a condom on a banana and sex ed once. Um, I thought that was weird, but if that's your thing, go for it. Um, but there are a lot of ways to to help students understand what different types of sexual safety are and how to use them. Okay. Um, I very much would like to watch, I, I very much would like to write a book um, called How to Date an Autistic Person. Um, and um, because Dating and romance is very much interpreting social nuance, which is something that is very hard for autistic folks. Um, so I use a lot of like very explicit direction around how to ask people on dates, how to tell someone you have a crush on them. Um, lots of um, flirting is hard. I don't always know when people are flirting with me. Um, teaching people how to flirt, how to ask people on dates, how to tell someone you have a crush on them. Um, I think it's awesome to role play uh, model scenarios for them, offer scripts. Um, uh, romantic feelings are often linked to physical sensations. Those are like awesome, but sometimes overstimulating. Um, this is autistic people often get very hyper fixated on things. And sometimes when there is romantic interest, people get very fixated on people. So it's very important to help them understand that, that is dangerous. Um, that is sometimes what leads to things like stalking. Um, and, um, yeah, but dating and romance, it's very much, again, social nuance, lots of, lots of like explicit instruction necessary. Um, it, when I write a book called how to date an autistic person or how to date while you're autistic, you all will be the first to know. Um, but I'm not going to sit here and pretend I'm a dating expert. I'll just tell you that explicit instruction on, on, on dating and romance is important and necessary for this population. Okay. This is my favorite statistic of all time ever, um, which is that 70% of autistics are LGBTQ plus with 50% of that population being trans. 70% uh, and 50% both round up to 100. Awesome, that's a huge number. What does that mean? This means that all autistic individuals need to be talked to and informed about queer and trans identities and how those folks have sex. Um, this also means that if you are teaching sex ed to your autistic students, you need to be comfortable and competent in the subject of, of queer and trans issues, which a lot of people are not. Um, queer and trans autistic folks are even more likely, some articles say like twice, five times, whatever, um, likely to end up in trouble with a lot of things, contract STIs, have negative mental health outcomes, excuse me, all things that are completely preventable with adequate sex education. Um, I, it is not that hard to teach about gender and sexuality, use the real words for these things, define them, show videos, interviews, um, use pictures of people who hold these identities, 
make sure you're using pictures of people who hold a variety of racial identities, sexual identities, gender identities, and gender expressions. Um, but there's a lot of really good, um, there's way more information about how to be queer and trans inclusive in the classroom out there than there is about autistic sex ed. So I'm not going to suck up anyone's time talking about that when that I trust that there are really awesome rad sex educators out there doing it themselves. Um, but just know that it's important. I cite the 70% statistic in every single thing that I write. It's a really awesome number. I have a lot of theories as to a lot of autistic people on why that is, but um, yeah, just a cool number to know. A good fun fact, if you will. Um, pronouns. Okay, everyone has pronouns. Everyone's always like, Jill, and you only care about pronouns because you're trans. Nope, I care about pronouns because everyone has them um, and respecting people's identities is important. I teach people to introduce themselves with their pronouns, ask for other people's pronouns, uh, ask people what their pronouns are. Um, I know a lot of people who teach pronouns by being like, people who look like this use this pronoun, people who look like this use this pronoun. Um, and we, that's very dangerous. Um, um, yeah, that's, that's very dangerous to do. Um, so instead you have to ask, for example, I have a beard. So everyone and their mother assumes I use he, him pronouns. I don't. Um, and you cannot tell what someone's pronouns are by looking at them. Um, teach singular they. People tell me that I don't know how to teach singular they to black and white, concrete, non-abstract thinkers. <laughs> I'm sorry. I bet it's really frustrating. But also, you can do it. Um, I think there are a lot of good, like, some people feel like a boy or a, not a boy or a girl or both. Or, you know, break down non-binary in some other way and explain that. Lots of people who identify that way use they, them. But a lot of people with all sorts of identities use they, them. Um, but I really think it is 2020, whatever year it is, 23 now, maybe. Um, it's time that we use they, them pronouns correctly for people who use them. It is not that hard. I'm not going to lecture all of you about it, but you can do it. Okay. That was a lot of, how are we doing on time? Good for me. I'm impressed. Um, so this is my, like, I will finish this off with, I just presented you with like, why we need to be doing this, what we need to be talking about. So now I will tell you actually the very little that I know on how to do it because you all know the people you're working with better. So I do not work with any of your students. I'm not the parents of any of your children. So I can only give you advice based on general autism work, but I will take, I will trust your expertise with the people you are working with. So my big tips are be explicit, clear, and direct. Um, I think that the more explicit, clear, and direct that you can be, the better. I am not someone who like, I will not, if you're saying metaphors over my head, if you're expecting you to pick up on subtext over my head, if you're asking you to make inferences over my head, none of it, I will miss all of it. Uh, maybe I'm very frustrating to communicate with, uh, who's to say? Um, but be explicit, clear, and direct. Um, use correct terminology for all things sex ed. I promise it is easier. I promise it goes way farther. I promise it actually makes real life long-term lasting consequences. Use lots of visual aids. Um, and then I would love to come at you with like, I have an evidence-based research supported sex ed curriculum with assessments for you to do, but I don't yet. Um, and when I do, I will share with the world, but, um, Sex ed is another area of academic study. You assess all other fields of academic study. Assess sex ed content. If you teach sex ed and then your students don't get it and they go out into the world, you've actually done nothing helpful. Um, so it's super important to like make sure your students know it um, before you release them into the world. Um, no matter what type of information you are giving them, please make sure it sticks. Um, if you use any certain type of assessment in your school with your children, I think stick to what you know works for them and keep doing it. Um, who should be involved? Everyone. Um, we know that autistic students have a much harder time generalizing information across contexts, which means that you do need both home and school on board. Um, I will talk, <laughs> I'll give you my like brief to do about parents, but it does mean that if you're only having sex ed conversations at home or only having sex ed conversations at school, it's very hard for students not to know like, oh, well, I was talking about this at school. I didn't know I couldn't talk about it at home or vice versa. So creating an open environment to have these conversations with is super important and awesome. Um, a lot of autistic people also have outside providers. So making sure that they are also on the same page is, is also super important. 
All right, there are parents on this call. This is not any sort of this is not any sort of screw you to all of you. I'm sure you're wonderful parents, but as a group, parents can be very frustrating for educators to deal with. Um, so I will just give you my like thoughts on dealing with parents based on what works for me. Uh, to this, so they are not here. Um, but I will say that parents in general don't like thinking about their kids having sex. I have two really sex positive parents who like, I don't think they want to know what my sex life is like either. That's normal. Um, parents of autistic kids do sometimes have ableist bias about what their kids can and cannot understand, but it is really normal to like not want to be having conversations with your children around their sex lives. I think that's very like societally expected. However, if you are an educator trying to help parents understand that you do need to be having these conversations with their children, I think I frequently play the prevention card with like, listen, I understand it is hard for you to imagine your kid having this conversation. It is harder to think about your kid ending up in some sort of dangerous situation. And if you and I are going to prevent your kid from ending up in some sort of dangerous situation, here are the statistics on all the things that they are at risk for. Here's how we know that I can help by having this conversation. Um, Parents don't really want negative outcomes for their students any more than you do. Um, and sometimes we'll back down from fighting good sex ed if they realize that they are making sure that their kids are not um, at risk for things. All right. Um, I think sex ed should be on IEPs because it is an academic subject and something that people have goals in. We are not there yet. IEPs are legal deficit-based documents. That's a conversation for another day. Um, but all people have different needs and goals for sex education, just like they do for all academic content. Um, if you know things about how your students learn math or reading, there's so much research out there on how autistic people learn other academic subjects. Um, please, please, please um, use what you know to help them learn um, sex ed. Right, I'm very pleased with myself because I did almost under an hour and 15. So that is a lot of information. Some of it probably new and uncomfortable. You might be super overwhelmed. Um, you can sit with it. Uh, I am trying to figure out how to share slides slash recording in a way that um, is makes the most sense based on, um, yeah. But I, I am happy to do that once I figure out the best way to do it. But here's my contact information, which all of you probably already have. I am happy to talk through situations further. Um, yeah. Um, Angela, you can stop the recording and we can, um, if people have recording questions. Recording stopped. That noise haunts me in my dreams. Um, if, people, if people have questions, we can do them. If people want to go, um, we can do that as well. I've seen a lot of really good things come to the chat that I missed because like they were up, it's up here. Um, but yeah, that's a lot of information. So if people have things they'd like to share, questions they'd like to ask, um, now would be the time. You can put them in the chat or you can take yourself off mute because now I'm I, now I'm done talking very fast. I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Thank you. This is all really great. And I'm wondering how I can find good visual resources for my kids one of whom doesn't speak or read or have um he has a really hard time well, you know he doesn't have like uh, an established communication system that works for him yet he's 10 but he is an adolescent and we are needing to teach him about appropriate um, places and times for things and um, another, my other kids too, just really need the visual resource of understanding everything and finding pictures is so hard. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's so like, it's so hard for me because I like, I have this like life dream of a curriculum and I have to like, I have to finish my stupid program first. Um, <laughs> So it's like not available yet, but I frequently get asked from people like, what is your recommendation for a resource? And I'm like, I wish I had like some incredible thing to recommend for you. Um, honestly, when I'm looking for good visuals, I frequently go to the Planned Parenthood website. Um, okay. It's not like autism specific, but they have a whole like host of sex ed materials that is pretty easily like pared down and scaffolded and differentiated and explained. 
Um, I like that is where I frequently go when I'm looking for visuals. They have a lot of like good breakdowns of like things from like what does a vagina look like to like what does a condom look like. Um, so that might be where I would start. Um, but yeah, I I always tell people I'm like keep following me because in like the next three years I will have a really solid resource for you. I just um, I have to write a dissertation first. I totally understand that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. Yes, I'm seeing the chat. Planned Parenthood is coming out with Project Shine, which will be disability based sex ed. I do know that. So definitely, definitely Planned Parenthood is where I would start. Okay, another question. Do you have any advice on navigating hyperfixation while dating and having sex? For example, how to maintain consent practices and ensuring the hyperfixation behavior doesn't turn harmful to self or others? That's a great question. Um, I think that it is very important to help. In general, I think that um, the more that we can work with autistic people to um, to keep hyperfixation off of people, even friends, family members, like it, I think it gets very dangerous and down a rabbit hole very quickly. Um, and it is one of the things that like leads to um, that um, that leads to. Yeah, I mean, it is it is one of the things that leads to like stalking and other such things. Um, so I think that the more we can redirect any sort of hyperfixation away from any person. Um, I know people get hyperfixated on like TV characters, which I think sometimes gets very closely into a rabbit hole, a dangerous rabbit hole. Um, so personally, I'm like a huge fan of redirecting any sort of hyperfixated behavior away from any human. Um, I think that there are so many good topics and things to be hyper fixated on and learn more about that are not people. Um, I will say that I am someone who like, when I start to have a really strong crush on someone starts to go that route and have to like pair myself back and be like, all right, I need to like be thinking about and doing other things. Um, but it's hard. I just think like a redirection away from humans is, is generally good practice. I love the idea of IEP goals, but I'm wondering what direction that would go. Yeah, I mean, I just think that like IEP goals are like under such a format of like measurable with objectives and plans for checking in and assessments. And I'm like, why are we not like have having those like, yeah, like how are we how are we not having those same conversations around sex ed, right? Like if we know that kids need like three times of doing this math skill X number of times a week to be successful. But, like, I just think a lot of the same language. I think the more we can integrate sex ed into schools, instead of it being like, um, instead of it being like a taboo subject that we only do once in a while on Thursdays, and we do we do 50 minutes with, you know, I think that the more we can like build it as a consistent um, in school, similar to a lot of other subjects, the better. I think that'll also help undo some of the stigma of sex ed in general. <laughs> does does the destigmatization around masturbation include sex toys? Um, <laughs> uh, one of the people like next to me on the screen is someone who's on my close friends list on Instagram, where I post sales on sex toys literally at least once every three days. Um, I'm like a huge lover of sex toys and supporter of sex toys across the board. Um, yes, I am a fan of like let's talk about sex toys, let's use sex toys, let's use sex toys in sex, let's use sex toys in masturbation. I this is not my field. But there are so many physically disabled activists out there who talk about how sex toys are accessibility tools for sex. Um, there are people doing really awesome work. Um, Cripping Up Eva is a sex educator who is, you can follow her on Instagram, who like reviews sex toys um, based on their accessibility uh, procedures. Um, and yeah, I think that like, I, I can, I, I did not do 90 minutes on masturbation and sex toys, but maybe there's a follow up to this. It's 90 minutes on masturbation and sex toys, because like, truly, I talk about sex toys all the time with everyone in my life. I think they're so important. Um, I think they're really important when you are like learning skills um, to have sex. I think they're really important masturbation tools um, for a lot of people. I think that, yeah, in general, I don't know. I live in New York City. We have a lot of awesome sex toy stores here. 
Um, there are some really awesome ones on the internet too that are like very queer affirming and have a lot of really good disability tools. But yeah, I will I will type the name there. I think this is correct. Uh, okay, someone's gonna have to double check me because now I'm guessing myself. Cripping up sex with Eva, maybe? Someone can Google it and put it in the chat for us. Um, but yes, I really, I like could talk for the next 13 minutes about sex toys, but I won't. Um, but I think sex toys are very important. And um, obviously like you cannot purchase sex toys for your students, you will lose your job. But if you are the parent of an autistic young person, it might be like a conversation that is worth having and exploring um, for people with all sorts of genital makeups. They are very important and helpful masturbation tools. Cripping up sex with Eva. There you go. Thanks. She communicates with some assistive tech and like leads awesome workshops and um, stuff about like having sex with visibly disabled folks and using um, sex toys as a masturbation tool and um, is generally awesome. Other thoughts, questions? Uh, just wanted to share a quick story um, that happened to us recently. So I have a 14 year old autistic kid who also identifies as LGBTQIA plus and his very first, you know, relationship, we'll call it, <laughs> was with another autistic boy. Um, and it was very clear to me and to my husband that there must have been some kind of sexual trauma with the other child based on some of the language that they were using, um, some troubling behavior. We tried to let it die down naturally. It didn't. And for sure, the other kid was hyper fixated on our kid. Um, I I'm sharing this only because we ended up having a very long, explicit conversation with him about the dangers of that behavior, why we were concerned, and that we were trying to let him navigate this himself. But for his safety, we had to put a stop to it. And that made all the difference to just be clear. Um, you know, we had talked about personal safety and all of those things, just sort of alluding to it, but sort of calling it out and naming it and saying it in that instance, because it was, it did get a little bit scary for us as parents, especially. It made all the difference. And I think it helped him move on much more quickly too. So not to make it about me, but I just, I, that's a, you know, it was like a very, oh yes, this is a very concrete thinker moment, you know? Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, it, yeah, I mean, when trauma is a reason that people hyper fixate on other people is like, they've had sexual abuse in their background. And so um, I think that like, obviously I'm coming at this from like, let's prevent the trauma and the abuse. And then, and then we like, perhaps have um, fewer things to, to handle um, later. Okay. Also, while I was talking, someone sent me a very kind message to let me know that the right wing nut job is still live streaming this on her YouTube channel. So we tried really hard and she got it anyway. And I hope she has a great day. Um, You're welcome. But again, I'm like some of, some of me is like good for me. Like I, I, I am so pleased with myself for being radical enough that the, the right is like trying to live stream my content and complain about it. I'm not indoctrinating children. Um, yes, you are. It's worth, but yes, okay. you are. Um, okay. What do you and do? And we for got you red handed, Dylan. It is also sensory defensive. He is super frustrated and has behaviors because of it. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I see a lot of people like use masturbation as a stim um, because it feels good and has like a good release. But I think that, like, I don't know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it, it, if you do your Google that I suggested and like look up the Forbes article on like 16 great side effects of masturbation, it'll tell you that it's a really great stress release. Um, I'm wondering if there are ways to like help relieve that stress in other ways in the meantime. Um, obviously like you can't force someone to masturbate, even if you think it'll be helpful. Um, but I think that like redirecting that stress, maybe some other fidgets or some other stims, um, would be very helpful for a student who is very frustrated. And like, even if that's sexual frustration, like you can write, you can redirect some of the, the sexual frustration elsewhere with other tools. Well, someone is not ready to masturbate. Hopefully he does eventually.
I will read, as an autistic individual who went through puberty, it's also important for the parents and support system to be educated around sex ed as well. Yeah, th I think this goes back to my point of like, it's super important for the, these conversations to be happening in like all spheres of someone's life. Um, it is really hard. Um, you know, I, I, in, in my dream world, when I like have already had a curriculum, like I get to train teachers and parents so that we're all on the same page of delivering this content. Um, because it's so hard if you're like having these conversations in school and then you come home and your parents aren't with it and like they're not having these conversations with you. Or what happened to me is like I was having these conversations at home and then I would go to school and like nobody was having these conversations with me there. So I was asking a lot of questions and like just getting shut down. So I think either way, like just across the board, sex ed conversations and support. Um, we know that autistic people like need generalizable information. So information happening in one location and not the other is very, um, it's hard. You are welcome to keep asking questions. You're also welcome to go enjoy the rest of your Thursday evening. Um, and um, again, thank you all so much for being here. I hope that you learned something. Um, you are all welcome to be in touch. And um, you have my email that I sent the today's crisis update um, to. Um, and um, yeah, thank you for thank you for being here. All right, guys, I think we are out of the stream. And I want to thank our intrepid spy. Man, Dylan, I have to say, I have to say that that webinar exceeded even my expectations on so many levels. There is so much to unpack in what we just saw. First, I want to say, mount that like button if you appreciated that I am the only person on the internet bringing you inside these trainings so that you can see exactly what is going on when they think you're not listening. <coughs> I'm the only person on the internet showing you this stuff. And I want to thank my intrepid team of people, the Unwoke Army, that are always there to help me pull this stuff off. These are people who are just regular people, just like you, who are members in my community, who want to remain anonymous on the internet because not everyone wants to be public on the internet. And, um, but they do want to help and they want to do what they can. And they show up and they infiltrate webinars. And we have backup upon backup upon backup upon backup upon backup when we're doing this stuff now because we know how you guys operate, Dylan. We know you're going to try to do a bait and switch. We know you're going to kick me out as soon as you find out I'm streaming it because you don't want the public knowing what I what you're doing. And so we have we have backup measures in place. We have finally honed spy stream. Congratulations, guys. Big group hug. We made it. We made it. Special shout out to the spy that was providing the stream tonight. Special shout out. What we can we can do different spies next time. We gotta switch it up. We can't let them get used to seeing the same person. We gotta have a different person next time, a different person the time after that. We got the whole setup worked out now. But there's so much that we need to unpack from that webinar. Oh my god. So much. So he is not so he's not even officially he. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. I and I really do mean this. I do try to respect the pronouns. I'm just really bad at it. They, the non-binary presenter that we just watched, Dylan, is not even officially diagnosed as autistic, is a self-diagnosed autist. So that makes me question the entire premise of this whole thing, because really at the beginning, it seemed like Dylan just really wanted to promote TikTok more than anything else. I have never heard in a single presentation, someone talk so much about their own sex life and their own, dare I say, lived experience. That was so uncomfortable. It would I, And I know a lot of you were uncomfortable as well hearing that. Um, we know that Dylan really, 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 really likes to talk about masturbation with children. 
We know that Dylan really, 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 really enjoys talking about masturbation with children when the parents are uncomfortable talking about masturbation with children. Dylan's like, don't worry, I got it. I'll talk about masturbation with your kids. It brings me great joy. We know that Dylan really likes to talk about sex toys. Like, was was exceptionally excited about talking about sex toys. Um, they, the trans man, let yeah, well, the non-binary, trans, queer. Again, I respect people's gender identity. But yeah, yeah. There are so many clips that I have to make from that. I'm just like, I'm, I'm, I'm left shell-shocked at that presentation. And remember, guys, that was a presentation on autistic sex education. That is a presentation that was not targeted at parents. It was not targeted at parents. I mean, parents were attending and that's fine. In fact, there was a whole section about how Dylan found parents to be a giant pain in the ass. That's going to get clipped, Dylan. You want to call me a right wing nut job on the internet when I'm not even on the right wing? We'll see what happens, sweetheart. But that was targeted at teachers. That was targeted at teachers. And did you guys catch at the beginning? I know we were having a lot of fun because we really felt like we were getting one over on them. But did you notice at the beginning, Dylan said that they had presented the presentation that we just watched tonight at the National Sex Education Conference. This is not someone in the far off corners of the internet conning people out of money. And by the way, Dylan, if you don't refund my money, I'm reporting you to Eventbrite for stealing it because I didn't get to get into it. I got no notice. Thank God I had spies. That was presented at the National Sex Educators Conference, which it sounds like I would need to. I, I, I think I want to go to it next year. Guys, just so you know, I'm going to be trying to go to some of these events in person if I can. I'm going to need crowdfunding to do it. But like, I want to go to some, like, I want to go, like, I think, I think it makes sense for us, for there to be a representative at the National Sex Education Conference. If it, it doesn't need to be me, if someone else wants to go, like, if someone else in the Unmoke Army wants to go and report back, that's fine. But like, that was presented on a national stage to teachers, presumably. And one of the things too, and, and this was something that I think Stephanie and I were talking about before the presentation where Stephanie was like, I think it's legit to teach autistic kids about sex so that they don't get taken advantage of, they don't get abused. I completely agree with that. 100% agree. But when we got to that part of the presentation, Dylan was like, I really only do this part because this is what people get the grants for, and I don't really want to teach it, but we have to teach it because it's what gets the grants for. And then he talked begrudging, they, excuse me, then they talked begrudgingly uh about how um about how uh it, it is possible for autistic people to get abused which i don't think any of us think is a good thing and so it's like they didn't even want to talk about that they like gloss dylan spent more time talking about sex toys and masturbation than they did talking about how to teach autistic children to not get sexually abused that's that's how that's how seriously they take the topic of sexual abuse of children. Well, guys, thank you for attending the craziest spy stream yet. I will be doing a metric F ton of clips from this. And luckily, this actually worked out really well because now I have the backup recording on my second channel. That's just the raw video file. So we might do it this, this might actually be a good idea to do something like this in the future to stream it to a second channel and then beam it over here because then, um, then we have the raw recording in addition to the reaction recording. So that's pretty great. That's pretty great. Well, we're going to keep an eye on Dylan. Dylan, you and I are going to be friends. First, first, Dylan, I'm respecting your pronouns and all that. So I would, I would request this is just, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to have a chat with Dylan for a second. Then we're, I'm going to, I'm going to show some stuff. I'm going to tell you guys what's going on tomorrow and on Saturday. And then we're going to wrap up. Let me just, mo point of personal privilege. I'm going to have a moment where I'm talking to Dylan because you know, he's going to watch this whole thing after. 
Dylan, I respect your pronouns. I'm actually really, really socially liberal. I don't care if you're non-binary. I don't care if you're trans. I don't care any of these things. You are an adult. You can do whatever you want. I don't really care. However, if I'm going to be respectful of you, you got to be respectful of me because we're going to be in each other's lives now, Dylan. I am not on the right wing. I am a libertarian. I am not on the right wing at all. Dismissing people who have good reason to disagree with you is not going to be beneficial. And since I'm being respectful of your pronouns and your identity and you doing whatever the flip you want with your body, even though, yes, you are indoctrinating children, just because you say you're not indoctrinating children on a webinar, Dylan, after I just listened to you talk about how you have conversations all the time with autistic children, teaching them about masturbation when their parents don't want to, how much you love sex toys, and we talk about sex toys all day. Don't tell me you're not indoctrinating kids into your uh, when you when you said that they're basically 100% of autistic people are queer or gender nonconforming which is total and complete bullshit and you and I both know it maybe that's your fantasy Dylan maybe that's it but since we're going to be in each other's lives for a while now because we're going to follow you around the internet and we're going to do the if you do it Dylan please do a training on sex toys and masturbation please 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 do that training. We will be there, Dylan, and we're going to stream that shit too. And guess what? Next time, next time you're not going to get advanced notice, honey. Next time I'm just going to do a pop-up stream and you're not going to get the Substack article. You're not going to get the tweets. You're not going to get it. I'm going to use a fake name when I register. Do you know how many aliases I have, Dylan? Do you know how many fake accounts I have? Do you know how easy it is for me to register for any webinar you do and not give you any advance notice that I'm doing it at all. And as you saw today, it's never just going to be me registering for your webinars, Dylan. It's never just going to be me, some lone right-wing nut job. So please, 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 please do that webinar about sex toys and masturbation, Dylan. We'll be there. We'll do it together. It'll be fun. It'll be fun. But guys, thank you for attending Spy Stream. Now, I just have a couple things because for, for once, for once, I've actually gotten my shit together and I've done something early. So tomorrow on the channel, we do have happy hour at 5 p.m. Eastern time. And we're going to continue with trans activism. We are going to watch a training called Where Trans Activism and Abolition Meet. Happy Hour is a little bit like Spy Stream, except the training is not live. It's recorded. It might be, I think this is a relatively recent one that we're going to watch. Um, and, uh, but, but, but sometimes we watch stuff that's older. Sometimes we watch stuff that's newer. We have drinks. I forgot to get my beer tonight. So good thing I have lots of beer tomorrow. I recommend you get a beer as well. Come and join us at 5 p.m. Eastern time where trans activism and abolition meet. This is for, this is from the Center for Applied Transgender Studies. So I'm sure that's going to be woke as shit. And then on Saturday, Socialism Saturday is back. And at 6 p.m. on Saturday, we are going to be watching Life After Capitalism. And this is also a presentation that was just done like in the last week or so at the University of Pennsylvania, which is slightly less woke than Columbia University, which is where Dylan is getting his degree, but uh, or their degree. God damn it. So we will be watching that on Saturdays at 6 p.m. We go live a little bit later on Saturdays because it's my weekend, too. Now, on Saturdays, one of the reasons we're going live at 6 p.m. on Saturday is that in my supporter community, we're doing Bitchcraft on Saturday. Bitchcraft is where we have an open Zoom call where we bitch and we craft. I, of course, will be knitting as the far most superior of all crafts, but you can crochet, you can sew, you can paint, you can draw, you can clean your gun, you can fold your laundry, you can play video games, you can just come hang out with us. We'll be doing that on Saturday at 3 p.m. in my supporter community. And then on Sunday... We are doing movie night. It is Jennifer January. We are watching Equilibrium in my supporter discord. You can get access to my supporter discord by becoming a, a member of my YouTube channel, B, a member of my local, C, a member of my Patreon, or D, a member of my Substack. And I'm really encouraging everyone to become a paying member of my Substack. I'm trying to meet a goal of getting 100 new 
paying members on my Substack this month because Substack is going to be my home base moving forward. I publish almost daily articles. You would have been notified about Spy Stream had you been a member on my Substack, whether or not you're paid or free. And the reason that I want to get 100 new paid members is I want to be able to keep everything on my Substack free for everyone. Some people can afford to support my work. Some people can't. I really want to make sure we're, we're, I'm, I'm getting it out to as many people as possible. But I also have to make a living too. And so if I don't get 100 new paying support, orders by the end of the month, I'm going to be putting up a paywall for some of my articles. I really don't want to do that. But but it's just a reality, guys, I need people to support the work I'm doing. I'm an independent, I don't want to be beholden to any political interest. I don't want to be beholden to a right wing nut job organization, because contrary to what Dylan thinks, I actually think a lot of people on the right are lunatics. I don't want to be beholden to anyone. I want to be beholden to myself. And I want to be beholden to you and to what the truth is and showing you the truth. And that's what it's about. So you can uh, become a member on my Substack, five bucks a month, 50 bucks a year. I actually just saw the super chat from Kate. Um, I signed up on Substack tonight. Here's a piece of your Eventbrite cancellation. Thank you, Kate. I really, really appreciate it. All right, guys, that is all we have for tonight. I will see you guys tomorrow for happy hour. And I will see uh, those of you who are coming to Bitchcraft or movie night or Socialism Saturday. We'll see you soon. We got lots of stuff rolling. And um, God, tonight was fun. Did you guys have fun tonight before we wrap up? Did you have fun? Come on. That was fun. And by the way, if you ever see a live woke training, tell me about it. Send me a message. Send me a DM on Twitter. My DMs are open on Twitter. Send me the training because it could be on spy stream. All right, guys, take care. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you soon.